Okay, guys, now then, this is the short answer paper one from last year. Uh, again, I'm going to do two videos. I'll do half of it and then the other half. So there's eight questions altogether. So I'll do them in two fours. Right, let's have a look. Question number one, or what will it be? It'll be 21, won't it? Yes. Okay. Um, what I've done basically is taken the answers that QCA have provided on their website, where I showed you at the start of the last videos. Uh, what they do is they give the answer and then they give the marking points as well. Now, I haven't copied the marking points out every single time. In fact, I've only copied it out this first time just to show you what is actually provided by QCAA. So the other answers you'll see will just have the answer. Okay. If you want to see how the marks go, download the guide from the QCA uh, chemistry assessment page where I showed you in the previous video. Right, question 21. Calculate the pH of a 0.1 molar aqueous solution of barium hydroxide. Assume complete dissociation. A barium hydroxide is a strong base, hence the assumption is complete dissociation. And the first thing you need to be aware of, of course, is that every time one of these dissociates, you're going to get two hydroxide ions. So if the OH minus concentration is required, you need to double that value there. To make 0.2. You then do the pOH, which is the negative log of the hydroxide ion concentration. All right, very simple. Use your calculator, get a 0.7 value, and then hopefully you're aware that the pH, <coughs> excuse me, and the pOH added together equals 14. So simply subtract the answer from 14 and you get the, the pH. Now, one or two things to mention, guys. In the paper, you will see an outside line here, and you'll also see occasionally some boxes for answers. It is vitally important that you keep your workings within these, these lines. See that this box basically do not go outside of those lines. You have to put your answer inside. When they're marked, a computer scans them and only scans what's inside the box. Anything you might write outside will not be seen by the marker. So please keep all your workings within the box. And this 13.3 needs to go there. Otherwise, again, you will lose a mark. If you've got 13.3 like it is out here, it is not enough. You need to put that 13.3 in the actual answer box. Question 22, the structural formula for pentane is shown and it asks for two structural isomers and the names of each. The obvious first one would be to shorten the chain to four, bring that carbon on the end into one of the middle carbons and do that. And that name then, which will go here, okay, is 2-methylbutane, okay? You can argue the 2 is not really needed because the methyl group couldn't go anywhere else. Again, my answer is simply copied, so my answer is there. That needs to be there, guys, okay? Make sure you put the answer where it should be. Uh, another possibility would be this one here. You get one mark, obviously, for the structure. And again, one mark for putting the name there. Again, it's got 2,2-dimethylpropane. I would argue that the twos are not needed. You couldn't put those methyls anywhere else. So dimethylpropane would be uh, sufficient, but the right, it must be written there. Okay. Question 23. Aspartum is a methyl ester of a dipeptide that hydrolyzes to form methanol and two amino acids. The structure is shown. Okay, now, first of all, you will notice here's your ester group, and here is the methyl group, which is the methyl ester of the dipeptide. So the amino acids themselves will not contain that CH3. That's coming in later. Now, that looks pretty complex. However, if you go to the data book, 
and scroll down to the almost the end, you will see two tables. Now, aspartic acid was one of the amino acids, and the other one was phenylalanine. So for convenience, I've copied both of those into the answer. All right, now that wasn't needed. Okay, now if you're wondering how did I know they were the two, well, you've got to basically go to the list. First of all, see that ring there? If you look at the list of amino acids, that's, that one there is the only time that ring appears away from anything else. There, it's got an OH on it. It's not in this table at all. So if you want the ring with nothing else on it, if there was an OH there, it would have been the other one. But the ring without anything else has to be phenylalanine. Now, clearly, the peptide link is there. So effectively, we have another amino acid which will have um, one, two, three. Um, there'll be a carbon there, carbon there, carbon there and then another carbon there. So this has two carboxylic acid groups. So one would be there, one would be there, and in between is obviously the uh, NH2 group, which you see there on the second carbon, and another CH2 there. I know this is not easy because they're drawn like this in your data book, and they don't look like that in the structure they've given. So you've just got to realize that there is a COH, that's the COH, there's a CH2, there's your CH2, there is a CHNH2, there's your CHNH2, and there would have been the COOH, which of course has lost the OH in the condensation reaction to form the peptide or my bond. Okay, uh, I don't think that's easy, and I don't think They've particularly made it easy by showing you a structure like that. But there we go. You've got to simply make sure you, um, you can work that out. All right. So anyway, you, you would have got a mark for, well, one mark for both amino acids. I think that's a bit tight, but there we go. Okay. You then hydrolyze the aspartin. Now, if you do that, you're going to break the peptide into the two amino acids, and you're going to get both aspartic acid and phenylalanine. Okay, then we hydrolyze, the hydrolyzed sample is spotted there, and when it's run using butanol and ethanoic acid as solvent, as you can see, there are two spots. Okay, now, which amino acid corresponds to spot A? Well, clearly, you can see it's R2, okay? R2 is reference amino acid Two. Let's have a look what it says. Which amino acid? Isoleucine is a nonpolar amino acid. Okay. There's a mistake in their answer machine. Uh, in their answering, guys, the two amino acids, as they said, were aspartic acid and phenylalanine. And now suddenly, <laughs> isoleucine has appeared as if by magic. This is a mistake, guys, okay? Anyway, if you're using butanol and ethanoic acid as solvent, you're dealing with fairly polar solvent. So if you look at the two amino acids here, hopefully you can see this would be the more polar of the two, it's got that extra COH, whereas this has got a non-polar benzene ring. So this would be the more polar. This would move further in that solvent. Okay, so spot A, you can see, has traveled further than spot B. Spot B would be phenylalanine. And spot A corresponds to R2, the reference amino acid, which, of course, would be aspartic acid, not isoleucine it's in fact it's it's all the hell here guys um it's got isoleucine is a non-polar amino acid right which it is but unfortunately isoleucine is not there 
What it should read instead is uh, aspartic acid is a polar amino acid and therefore spot A would travel a similar distance to R2, which again is aspartic acid, okay? Um, yeah, I, I really don't know what they've done here. I'm sorry, guys, they've made a horrible mistake. So uh, spot A is also nonpolar. Spot A is polar. And then they've got spot A is phenylalanine. Oh, okay. They, they've made a horrific mistake here. Um, this solvent, butanol and ethanoic acid, is polar. They're saying, basically, that the solvent is nonpolar. All right, and they're saying the nonpolar phenylalanine is traveling further. It's, it's completely wrong, guys, okay? This answer is completely wrong. So what it should read is spot A is clearly polar because it's traveling further in this polar solvent mixture. Spot A would be aspartic acid, so R2 would also be aspartic acid. Spot B is not moving as far. Now, it will be slightly polar because clearly it does have the COH and the NH2. So it's, it is polar, but not as polar as aspartic acid. So it will travel in the polar solvent, but not as far. So spot B basically is um, uh, R1, and that would be phenylalanine. R3 is isoleucine, which as you can see is not there at all. Okay, so uh, they've gone haywire here, okay? You can see isoleucine is correct. It is a nonpolar amino acid. It would be back here somewhere. Okay, it would travel the least distance of all. And when it says, why are the reference amino acids included? They're included basically to, you know, show what the amino acids are. So if you think you've got a dipeptide which contains aspartic acid and phenylalanine, then you should make R1 and R2 or one of those, or two of those three, the amino acids you're looking for. And as you can see, R1 is, is phenylalanine, R2 is aspartic acid. R3 is indeed isoleucine, but it shouldn't be up there. It should be back here. Okay, I think I'll stop there because I think I'm going to be running out of time. That one took me a lot longer. So I'm going to start with question 24 in the second part of this.